morning. It's good to see you uh, today. Um, like BJ, I'm not going to hold myself to time, uh, but uh, Al, Al is here to pull me off. Uh, so I, I am the managing PI of Forge, and um, this is a picture of, of the area uh, where, we, where we have Forge. There's a power plant in the background. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, just to put this in, into context, imagine generating electricity or heating and cooling your buildings anywhere you want, any place in the world, at any time. That is the motivation for Forge. Okay? It's simple. And, and we think it's, it's important uh, to move forward. And I'll talk about Forge in, in a little while. To put it into a little uh, additional or, or different context, this is the largest project DOE has ever awarded. It's the largest project the uh, university has ever received. We are currently at 220 million to 2025. Uh, a month or two ago, we put in an extension proposal to 2030 for an additional 115 million. So this is a large project, okay? And, and we've got a fantastic group of people uh, working on it. Um, the project is located, there is no pointer, in, in uh, South Central Utah, near the town of Milford. Um, give you a little more information about that, but, but there's 1,500 people there. It's a, it's a sm small burg, and they love renewable energy. Uh, and so this is a great place to be. You can see Salt Lake City and some of our partners. 50% of the money goes to operations. The other 50% goes to R&D. We're currently funding uh, 50 million in R&D, some of this for tool, tool development, uh, uh, isolation devices, for example, sliding sleeves, um, tractors. Uh, the remainder of it is going for basic research that, um, and, and this work is being done by oil and gas companies, by universities, by national labs, by consultants. Okay. We just released uh, another solicitation, this one for 45 million. Uh, so by the end of next summer, there'll be 100 million out in, in R&D. All of that is managed by Forge, managed by the University of Utah. Okay. Uh, so you're familiar with geothermal systems. If I'm in your way, am I in your way? Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Heat pumps, you know, no water involved, just, just shallow wells in the ground. Discharge heat in, in the summer and, and accept heat from the ground in the winter. Okay? And buildings all over the world. So geothermal heat pumps everywhere, fastest growing segment uh, of geothermal. Direct use, we take the water um, directly and we can heat buildings. The, the prison down by the point of the mountain has been heating 330,000 square feet of prison space for, for decades. So significant savings, all right? I'm in your way, I'm down here. Okay, oh, okay. Binary plants, those of you on the field trip will see one. If you're gonna use oil and gas wells to generate electricity, you're gonna use a binary plant. They are also known as organic rank and cycle plants. So they get up to about 200 degrees C. The reason is they have to be pumped. Pumps don't work above 200 degrees C. So it's a beautiful niche market for companies like Ormat and new companies coming, coming along. The flash plants, steam turbines, we will see one. These are typically associated with, with volcanoes. So higher temperature up, up to say 300, uh, 325, 350 C. At temperatures higher than that, the, the rocks tend to be ductile. They don't want whole fractures open, but we can certainly find higher temperatures. That's not an issue. And then, of course, EGS or forage, enhanced geothermal systems, deeper, hotter. We're sort of getting into the oil and gas realm now, okay? And, and that was the goal. So forage um, up to right now 225 degrees C temperatures have been measured, but we can get much hotter. So we're going we're gonna to focus on forage. So in, in a simple-minded uh, system, natural geothermal systems, are convection systems, okay? And they have three legs like, like a chair, all right? They have heat, could be the natural gradient or volcanic heat or, or subsurface magma body. Um, they need water to transport the heat 
Um, we can talk about other fluid mediums, but, but it's, it's dominantly water. Some, some are steam only in the fractures. You're not going to deal with them. And there are only maybe five in the world. So we, we don't worry about the, the steam systems. And of course, we need the permeable fractures. Uh, and I know Dave has seen this, and maybe I'll bring it later, but that's, that's a piece of core showing a fracture. That's what the reservoir looks like. It's not a sand reservoir. It's not a permeable reservoir. Maybe 10% uh, of, of the rock volume is fractured. So it's a small volume, okay? And, and they, they just act like convective systems. The, the cold water is dense. It sinks along faults, like along the Wasatch Fault. Heats up, uh, maybe hits an impermeable barrier comes back up other other faults. Okay. Simple convective hot spring system, right? It's no more complicated than that. Uh, in the basin and range here, three to five kilometers will get to the temperatures that we see in, in these geothermal systems. Okay, over the past few years, um, we've seen a, a resurgence in, in geothermal energy and, and, and in developing geothermal systems. And these are some of the, the drivers. Obviously, climate change is a huge one. I don't have Ukraine in here, but, but obviously that is a, is a major one. But, but increasing heating and cooling costs, especially in Europe, right, uh, and Africa. Uh, heating is more important than, than generating electricity for air conditioning. But, but the costs of heating are, are quite high. We're looking at lithium. Uh, there have been projects to, to get lithium out of the salt sea brines. There have been projects to get, um, uh, to use phalarite for uh, zinc out of salt and sea brines. These are, are, these are more typical oil and gas, 330,000 parts per million total dissolved solids, temperatures up in the 300 C range. Very hot, very atypical. Typical geothermal system, 10,000 parts per million, you know, maybe 1%. Total dissolved solids, basically benign, basically drinking water, except for, for the toxic constituents that they contain. So, so very low salinities. Um, not much of a problem. Obviously, water loss for, for boilers. And, and we do have a uh, building on campus, the Gardner Commons building, which um, people that, that come to class, and, and BJ taught one and John, uh, didn't even know it was geothermally heated and cool. But it's, but it's on campus. And, and then uh, significantly, DOE in 2019 came out with a goal of generating 60,000 megawatts by 2050 from 3,700 today. And then two weeks ago, DOE came out with their Earthshot um, strategy. Uh, Secretary Granholm announced this in, in, in Houston. And, and her goal is, is to cut the cost of enhanced geothermal electricity by 90% to $45 a megawatt hour. So DOE is looking to put more money, and that's by 2035. Okay. So how are we going to get there? That, that, that's, a, that's an important question. Well, enhanced geothermal systems are going to spend the whole, whole hour, whole half hour on, on that. Obviously, we can uh, stimulate low productive wells. So it doesn't have to be brownfield wells. We, we, can, we can be on the margin of an active geothermal system. Margins of geothermal systems are margins because they don't have permeability, but they have heat. So if we create the permeability, we can expand the systems. Um, abandoned oil and gas wells. We'll talk a little bit about that. I know that's on everybody's mind. It's challenging. It's very challenging. Okay? Um, Closed loop systems, uh, so uh, we can think of putting uh, antifreeze in a closed loop system. That, that's basically what we do for heat pumps, right? Pump it in, pump it out. Uh, that'll work, but it's conduction dominated. It's not an efficient system. It's not going to get us large megawatts, right? And then different fluids, obviously, CO2 uh, is one, and supercritical magmas. That's on everybody's mind nowadays. Every time you want to drill volcanoes or you want to go to Iceland or Hawaii, they both hit um, magma at, at depth. It, I, don't, I don't think it's going to build EGS across the U.S. There aren't too many volcanoes in mid-continent. Okay, so um, finding heat is not a problem. 
We can find heat anywhere we want. Finding the permeability is the problem. And so if we look at the, uh, the, the, the slide on, on the left at three kilometers, I'm going to use 150 degrees. I can generate electricity in the basin and range at the temperature of 150C. Okay? Average ambient temperature, about 70. So I'm just looking at the difference between air temperature and or inflow into the turbine and outflow. That, that's effectively what I'm looking at. So you can see at, at um, three kilometers, it's, it's mainly in the west. And as I, as I drill deeper to six, it's across the country. Uh, and th this was work that Jeff Tester did at MIT in 2006. And, and, and it finally caught, uh, caught the ear of our politicians back east. They all of a sudden saw that geothermal energy could be generated in New York, in Vermont, and, and up and down the East Coast in some of these granites. Uh, and that was a game changer. And, and that's when the concept of Ford started to come back into existence. But forge and, and hydraulic fracturing and building permeability is not a new concept. Uh, the first projects were at Fenton Hill. They were known as hot dry rock project. Um, and you can ask John all about it because he was on that, that project some years ago. Um, but you can see there are about 15 of these projects. Um, I've separated these projects from others that you might find in the Rhine Graben. These are all hydraulically fractured systems. They're all high temperature systems, okay? And they were all designed for, for electricity generation. Um, I haven't put forge in here because we haven't gotten very far yet, but, but eventually it will. Um, so what have we learned? Current state of affairs? There are no commercially viable systems at this point. Uh, Salts may be megawatt and a half. So it's not going to get us very far. It's not commercial. 5, 10 megawatts is, is going to be commercial. Um, what we found is that, and I'll show you in just a minute, we have uh, large fracture volumes, at least as, as defined by the seismic uh, data. But, but we have very low flow rates. I'm going to put a flow rate of 40 liters per second or 630 gallons per minute as economic. I want to see flow rates of 100, 80 to 100 to be economic. 40 is, is, is really a minimum. Can I get there? Nobody has yet. So let, let's keep the bar low. Uh, heat recovery is based on tracers, less than a few percent. Okay, We're not seeing interconnected fracture networks. Um, and what we are seeing is, is a flow from a few natural fractures. These are fractures that were intersected during drilling. They took fluid. They cooled. We know they existed during the drilling. And, and that's where the flow is today in these systems. And we'll talk about induced seismicity in just a moment. Okay? Okay. So I've just thought these are the simplest three research activities and solutions. John will talk much more, more about that. So we need to create interconnected fracture networks for long term. And long term is different for me than it is for you. Okay? You can probably pay for a well in a couple of years uh, in an oil and gas situation, but, but you can extract oil over many years. It's going to take me at a penny and a half per kilowatt hour 15 years to pay for that bloody well, okay? So that, that's a huge expense. Anything we can do to decrease the cost of wells is important. And, and I'll show total project cost, 50% is drilling, 50% is the plant itself. So drilling makes up a very significant component of, of a geothermal system. Obviously, I got to get better permeability. I got to have much higher flow rates. You know, 40 ain't going to do it. And you can convert that to barrels, I remember. Uh, and then we have to manage again seismicity. So how are we going to do this? Well, John has been pioneering here uh, highly deviated wells. We were the first to drill a highly deviated well on purpose for geothermal uh, applications. It was a 65 degree tangent. Nobody ever drilled beyond 30, 35 degrees. So that was a major uh, stepping stone. We're looking at perforated wells, you know, case the wells, control fluid flow, like, like you do in the oil and gas industry, not open hole. 
Currently, the geothermal industry completes their wells with open hole. We have hot, hard rocks. They don't cave, they don't fall in, they don't bridge over. Granites typically are metamorphics. You don't need to case them. You need to extract every little bit of flow that, that you can so you keep them open. And, and in fact, in geothermal systems, uh, what, what we find I is that um, we can do this. You know, it, it's not a challenge to keep these, these wells open. And, and typically, a geothermal well will have one to three major fracture zones, producing, say, up to um, 2,000 gallons a minute of water. So it's not the entire well. It's a few major zones that, that are critical. And a, and a picture I showed early is one of those zones in an active geothermal field in, in Steamboat, Nevada, near Reno. Okay. Uh, we have to manage the stress field. Nobody's been able to do that. It does what it wants. So we've got to figure out how to do it. And, and then we have to build high temperature tools. And, and you know, this is, I'm going to hear from you. No problem. We have them. In fact, one of the criteria for Forge was simply we're going, to, uh, we're going to set a temperature range where oil and gas tools work or require only slight modifications. Okay? Um, this is what happens to the tools. Sorry, there is none. Uh, you know, new, no, no elastomers anymore. Um, when, we, when we did this early on, I, I would guess on our plugs and packers, there was like a 99% failure rate in these. Uh, we've, we've used some interwell uh, plugs recently. They work, but, but there, are, there are issues that I have with them in, in terms of getting them out of the hole. Once they're in the hole, and I can't set them on wireline because temperatures are too high. So we've got to bring in a drill rig to set them. So, so there, these are real issues that, okay, I'll listen to you, and you can tell me they work. But our experience is they don't work very well in hot, hard granite, especially at temperatures in the 220. Anything over 200, boy, that's tough. DOE in 2014 set, set up the um, criteria for an EGS system. And, and there were basically four or five criteria. So they set that, that range of 175 to 225. Okay? And, and Milford, Southern Utah, we knew these temperatures existed in granite. Depths greater than one, one and a half kilometers. There was no real reason for that other than cost. DOE didn't want to drill two, three, or four kilometers because of the cost of drilling. So they just kept, uh, kept the um, uh, depth relatively shallow. Uh, low permeability, no permeability is it, really what they were looking for. It's great to be able to go out in the field and drill hot post holes. And everybody will applaud you for that. We have drilled, and I'll show you, six wells, a uh, total of uh, 11 barrels loss, losses so far in the six wells. And these are wells that, that are up to 11,000 feet long. So they're not short post holes. So no permeability, 30 micro darcies, maybe. This is great granite, and it's hot. What more can you ask for? Low risk of induced. We've been monitoring. Uh, the university have been monitoring for hazard since 81. I will show you there has never been a seismic event, a natural seismic event, below our footprint since 1981. But there have been swarms in the area. Um, low environmental risks. Out west, uh, sage grouse, prairie dogs, uh, there are no endangered hawks, but we, we have to watch for them. Um, butterflies, monarch butterflies that, that eat uh, milkweed, you know, is, is potentially endangered. We don't have them. We don't have any of them. There's no sage grouse. There's no prairie dog. I think I've heard there's one burrowing owl somewhere in the, you know, north 40, but I've never, never seen him. Uh, so that's great. Um, and then water contamination talk about that in just a minute, and no connection to a hydrothermal system. Uh, four kilometers away or less, there is a, a geothermal system called Roosevelt Hot Springs. Blundell Power Plant is on it. We are absolutely, totally separate from that. There is a hydraulic and thermal barrier between us 
and, and Roosevelt Hot Springs, and it's called the Opal Mount Fault, which has no geophysical expression. Okay, so we are located in Utah's renewable energy corridor. You can't ask for more, right? This is, this is fantastic. As we go from east to west, sorry again, um, here's the Blundell power plant, 36 megawatts, 36,000 homes, generating electricity since 1984 in the same granite that we have. Nobody's ever felt the seismic event coming out of, out of uh, injection there. And it's in, it's in granite. Great, so you can see the wet points here, right? Uh, and this is a high temperature system, 250 C. So this is a good steam system. Um, and this is a, a young, young volcano, Bailey's Ridge lava flow. Okay. Go, going, uh, here's our thermal and, and hydraulic barrier, the Opal Mount Fault. Um, our wells in the Ford site, this is purposely on state land. We're not on BLM land. We, we do not want to be involved with auctions and oil, oil and gas issues that, that typically associate, or, or even geothermal. It has to be, has to be auctioned in, in Utah. I don't want to be involved in that. So basically, we, we got that land for free. SIT was giving it to us. And their, their goal is to generate income for, for schools. SITLA is state institutional trust lands. As we move further west, you can see wind turbines. There are 168 of the wind turbines, uh, total, um, total capacity of 306. They run 22% of the time, okay? So 75 megawatts, about twice what the plant runs full time. As you go further west, there's a solar field. Again, it's about a 300 uh, megawatt field, and it runs also somewhere around to 25% of the time. Lots of wind. What, what you don't see here are the pig farms. There are now 25 pig farms, hog farms, between the wind rows, okay? Great. A and so each, each farm currently has 10,000 pigs living in it. So there's a lot of pigs there. God, and, and well, what can you do with a pig? You can collect the gas, scrub it, run it into a pipeline across, across the Ford site into the Dominion gas pipeline, the natural gas pipeline, and generate more electricity, okay? Um, and then there's a, uh, a biogas facility about 30 miles to the south of there. So what better place could anybody ask for to demonstrate some sort of renewable energy resource than in the middle of this, with, with a local population of 1,500 that loves it, okay? They think this is fantastic. We did a stimulation we'll talk about. 70 people on site. They had to use the hotels. They had to use the, the restaurants, the hardware store. Fortunately, nobody needed the hospital. But um, in fact, we overflowed the town. And if you're ever curious about Milford, look it up. Four champion bucking Bronco brothers and sons came from Milford. All right, so no endangered species, there's no human activity, and there's no pivots. God, isn't that great? Here we are out in the middle of the desert and there's no agriculture. That's because the groundwater, which is at 500 to 1,000 feet, is actually natural outflow from the geothermal system and it contains um, high concentrations of, of uh, toxic metals, arsenic, antimony, selenium, right? It's only about 500 ppm, but, but the state has declared this as non-potable water. Can't be used for human consumption, it can't be used for grazing, it can't be used for agriculture. And we own it. Nobody wants it. So the forge owns it. Okay, just uh, for the geologists, this is a, a picture of, of the geology of the site. Um, th this nice green color is our granites. These actually range from uh, all granite to granite diorite to diorite, 28 to 11 million years old. On the edge of, of that are these blues and grays. These are metamorphic rocks. They're the reservoir rock in the wells. I'll show you a picture of them next. And these are 1.7 billion year old rocks. Okay, so you would think they had lots of, lots of history, right? 
geologic history, fracturing, refracturing, but they're not permeable. And then you can see our site. Uh, these QRs are, are quaternary rhyolites. Uh, they're 750,000 years old. They're related to a cooling magma that sits underneath the valley. Okay? And this gives you some idea of temperatures, rocks. Okay? Yes? Uh, yeah, it's, um, this is a basin and range fault that has been rotated down to the east, has a 25 degree uh, dip to it, uh, and so it is a basin and range fault. It is locked, as far as we can tell. We've done detailed seismic surveys over this, 3D seismic surveys. We can't find any structure that, that cuts that uh, basement, and, and these structures sole out on top, top of the the granite, okay? Fantastic, right? No seismic events here. Um, so give you an idea of the rock types, the gneisses. These are sylmanite schists and gneisses. Um, there are some carbonates in there. And then these are examples of the granites. They're all pretty, pretty similar. They all have potassium feldspar, plagioclase, and quartz. And then they have trace, trace amounts of of uh, a few other uh, minerals. But they're all very similar. They're mechanically very similar um, as well. The, the top one is a rhyolite. We think that's a rhyolite dike that, that intruded along, along the fault and was, was sheared. It's not, it's not a young one. OK, since uh, 2018, 2017, we've drilled six wells. And, and here's the location of the wells. Um, you can see the windmills. Here, and you look, the lake in the background, kind of bluish, right? That's not a lake. Those are the solar panels in the back. And, and what you can't see farther down is the Blundell power plant, OK? So we have six wells. The, the wells in white have been drilled. The wells in yellow have not been drilled. Um, 58, 78, 78, B, 68, and 56, a vertical well, deepest is 95. 100 uh, feet, and, and 6,800 feet, 8,500 feet. So these are deep wells, seven inch uh, casing, nominally in these wells. Um, 16A is the injection well that we use for the doublet to create, create the reservoir. Okay? And that was drilled last year, um, and it's, it's got a 4,000 foot lateral. Um, the three wells that surround the, the tow area used for seismic monitoring, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in just a moment. Uh, so the 16A well is, is drilled 65 degree tangent, first time in, in geothermal applications that the well was purposely dr drilled to, to that deviation. Um, it's just expensive, and, and so the geothermal industry typically doesn't doesn't do it. We can talk more about that if you wish. So what is there, 5,000 feet or so of, of alluvium? It's all granite alluvium. Uh, in your terminology, you'd probably call it granite wash. So boulders of granite in, in relatively fine-grained uh, material. OK, temperature-wise, they all look alike. You know, they all have the same conductive gradients. There's no convection going here. Uh, convection would give us essentially a constant temperature with depth as the hot water rises and, and, and then turns over and cools. So these are conductive gradients. That means there's no permeability, right? That's what we were looking for. And you, and you can see this little um, excursion up on the top. Uh, and that's the groundwater. That's our groundwater. So we will ultimately drill a water well probably here to provide uh, for our circulation systems. Uh, currently, we just, we just buy water from Milford City. And we pay a couple of cents per gallon. It's another income source for, for the town. Okay? And, and so we use whatever services we can for sewage and uh, building the pads and, you know, as I said, uh, cleaning services. Uh, help. One of the major successes has been in, in drilling, you know, increasing the rate of penetration. When we, 
when we first started, the first well we drilled, 5832, was our test well to prove that we had conditions, temperature, low permeability, granite, uh, on and on. 10 to 13 feet an hour with the tricone bit. We tried PDC bits, we did no better, except that they cost me twice as much. So I stopped using PDC bits and we looked at the Chimera bit, you know, these hybrid bits, didn't do any better. Um, John brought in uh, folks from Texas AMU, uh, uh, Fred Dupreis and, and Sam Noynart, and they started to work with us, right? And, and they, they started to teach us about mechanical specific energy and minimizing that. And for the next three wells, we, we used mechanical specific energy and NOV, uh, who you may know for your, your bit manufacturing, modified bits on the fly, modified their PDC bits on the fly, changing the cutters, the cutter depths, the cutter geometries. And we went from 10 feet an hour to setting two record runs, 100 feet an hour. We, yeah. Uh, so so that, that is cut drilling times, ROP times, 50%, and then probably a 20% reduction in cost. Remember, 50% of the total cost of the, uh, of the development is in drilling. So fewer bits. Uh, the costs are still you know, relatively high. There's, there's a lot of uh, sort of downtime on, on this for, for coring, for logging. But, but we could probably complete this well. I, I think it was uh, the, this third one, um, you know, 15, 20 days, yeah. which is great in, in the granite, okay? Um, so that, that's been a major, major accomplishment. One of the learnings, you cut me off when I'm getting tired. Uh, one of the learnings was understanding the stress field, critical. The first wells that were drilled at, at Fenton Hill, hot dry rock system, the wells were drilled and then attempts were made to connect them. But, but the stress field wasn't understood and he didn't connect. So what we've learned Everybody has learned this: is you drill the well, you figure out you, you figure out first what your stress field looks like, what your your distribution of, of, of stresses are, then you drill the well perpendicular to the maximum horizontal stress or parallel to the minimum, and then you drill your second well, and I'll show you into the seismic cloud that you produce when you stimulate the first well. I'm going to show you a picture of that. So here we have one of the granite cores, natural fracture, you see an induced fracture. We interpret these as induced fractures. Induced fractures, they are vertical and they have a trend about north 25 east. We think these are induced because this is a vertical well and it is unlikely to hit too many vertical fractures in a vertical well. So we think they're induced. There are actually four sets of fractures. The dominant one dips about uh, 60 degrees to the west, sort of a north-south strike, okay? And the wells tend to walk along that direction, so we're constantly correcting. Um, you can see this was an FMI log before we stimulated the open hole section of, of the 58 well, so that's about 150 feet of open hole. And after, after stimulation at low pressures, we opened up this fracture, okay? I don't know anybody else has shown that. These are, these are high resolution, excellent FMI logs that, that Schlumberger did. Uh, we're currently using um, through the bit logging. I don't know if John will talk about that. Temperatures are too hot to run, run on wire line. It takes about four hours for these uh, wells to heat up to temperatures where the tools are, are, <laughs> are ready to fail at a million dollars a tool. No. <laughs> so through the bit, it's, it's, it's not, doesn't have the resolution that we're looking for. And, and so based on, on the FMI logs, this is a DFN uh, discrete fracture network. It also includes fractures that, that were mapped in the range. And these are primarily those uh, north-south or slightly northeast vertical fractures because there's no way to, to represent them simply from the FMI log. So, so that's really important 
to, to develop these DFNs. And this is, this is work being done by INL, Golder, and Itasca, FRACNIC. So how do we use this? Well, one of the ways we use these, these DFNs is, is to pick zones for stimulation. This obviously should be three. Open hole stimulation. You can see there are zones with high concentrations of optimally oriented fractures, those fractures that are ready to slip. And so during the stimulations that, that have been done, those zones were targeted. Okay? So it, it's not the oil and gas system where we're going to have a stage every 100 feet or, or so. Uh, so we targeted these zones. And they're all down at the bottom of the hole, and they're in nice. They're in this hard rock, okay? So that was, that was successful, and, and Inel and, and the folks there are looking at the seismic data and trying to predict, based on these DFNs, you know, how large this is going to grow. And, and so we're seeing maybe 600 feet predicted. We saw about 400. So it's not bad, not bad. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk much about this. We did three stimulations. Uh, Two slick water, one open hole, then one cased, and, and then one viscosified. And I know John will talk more about that. Uh, Liberty, Liberty did the stimulation. Uh, very successful. Uh, met our goals of 50 barrels per minute in open hole and um, 35 barrels per minute in the two cased zones. So this is what I meant before. We figure out where the stress field is, 16, a was drilled out to here, okay? It's perpendicular to the maximum horizontal stress. It was specifically drilled in that direction, and the pad was placed where it is for that. Um, do a stimulation, right? We did three at, at the toe. We ma mapped the seismic clouds. I'll show you them. Second well, which will come early in 2023, uh, will be drilled into the seismic cloud and ultimately will inject and produce. We have no responsibility to produce electricity in this project. Our entire goal is to de-risk EGS, build the tools, test the tools. Okay? That is what DOE is paying for. And like I said, when you, when you look at the bits and, and the improvements in ROP, it's working. It's paid for the project. And, and maybe in the oil and gas, you know, maybe some of you would, you know, would start to look at drilling some of these harder quartz sites with these, you know, with this kind of approach, the PDC bits and, and the MSE calculations. Okay. Um, the idea was to monitor everything. And, and so we used a couple of different types. We have a shallow monitoring network at three kilometers and, and, and uh, eight kilometers out. And those are post holes, 100 feet, okay? They're really shallow. So we had, we, we hoped to, to deploy eight level geophone strings in the three wells, the three deep wells at reservoir depth, temperatures above 200. All I can say is good luck. So that's the eight level Schlumberger geophone system, okay? Um, we used Avalon tools. So we used a, a digital system, which is supposed to reject heat. And, and stay cool, uh-uh, <laughs> it, it couldn't reject enough heat, and so they failed. Then, then we used analog geophones, they also, also. But, but what I think the wave of the future is, is uh, they, Avalon calls it a boss cable, but it's basically a DAS fiber optic cable with three component geophones in line. And, and we did use that at shallow temperatures, maybe uh, about 100 C. But this, this to us is probably the wave of the future because everything else fails. Cables fail, cable heads fail, tools fail, okay? But we did get some exciting, excellent data. We got about 30,000 hits. Uh, there's about 2,000 or so events here. They were all hand-picked and, and, and uh, hand-evaluated. This is stage one, okay? This is the open hole section. Open hole is white. 200 feet of open hole. There's no seismic events. We injected at 50 barrels a minute, right? No seismic event. The first seismic events, and this is time. Sorry. First seismic events 
showed up away from the well. And with time, they migrate to the well bore. Okay. I, I've asked them to go back and look for tiny events, but you know, at this point, they haven't seen. We had 30,000 triggers, uh, minus 2.3 to plus 0.5. Nothing, nothing bigger. Tiny, tiny. Uh, this had been opened in the past. John may have <laughs> done a good job opening it. So, so this is the vertical view. There's a horizontal view. What's also interesting, this was the second stage. Okay, This was the slick water. And this is the third stage. And, and that was the viscosified fluid. You see uh, the perforation zones, they were 20-foot guns. Um, they, they were mapped very, very well, located well. And what you can see with time is there are actually two branches on, on this. Uh, so, so the DFN seems to be taking, taking hold. I think it's DFN. I don't really think we're seeing uh, hydraulic fractures, but, but there may be disagreement there, or, or we don't understand them at this point. And, and so we're seeing about 400 feet of, of vertical height and mostly upward growth, okay? Very little downward growth. Um, really exciting data here. And, and, but we had problems. You know, it was, it was a challenge, it was a real, real challenge. Stage one, we had the, the, the eight level string, the Schlumberger string, and we had the boss cable, that DAS cable with the three components. Everything else failed, okay? And, 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 we couldn't wait to fix these uh, because Liberty was at 200K a day plus 15,000 per hour. So there's no downtime in this project. I can't, I can't afford it. So oh, the color scale here is only for stage one. So these are some greens. With this kind of, of, of deployment, we're looking at about 160 feet resolution. That's not good. It's really not good. Stage two, we got better. We got some more tools working. We still had the 58 level string. That was, that was down about 7,000 feet uh, at bottom. We, we ran dual songs. We ran the, those anal analogs in, in 56, 32, but the arms hadn't deployed. The, these were chemically set arms, so they take 24 hours and they open up and, and lock against the casing. So they weren't deployed, but, but at this point, stage two here, some turquoise, we're looking at 60 feet or so resolution. That's pretty good. Stage three, which is that one that branched, and, and we have the best control, uh, we had two eight-level strings working, and, and we have a 56, so we had three, three strings working. Our resolution is down now about 30 to 40 feet. And that's, that's really what we want. Uh, but since everything failed, next week we're going back in with, with higher temperature cables and better sons and new cable heads with, with dual plungers and we'll see if we work. Okay. Um, a different um, organic tracer, uh, naphthalene sulfonate, was put in each stage. Um, and, and so the idea was to see, one, if, if during flowback, uh, previous stages were flowing back into the later stages. And secondly, when we drill the next well, whether any of that fluid will reach the, the, the production well and, and we'll get a better understanding of fracture, fracture distributions. And, and once we pulled the bridge plugs, then that was every, everything changed, right? We got water coming back. Um, so just to summarize, thank you. I appreciate your patience. Uh, this, is a, this is a unique laboratory in the world. There is no other laboratory for forge, for de-risking uh, tools and techniques in the world. Okay? So if you get a chance to talk to your congressman, tell him. Believe me, I talked to, in Utah, I talked to Lee, and I talked to Stuart, and I talked to Mitt Romney every chance I can. Okay, I'm not bashful about that. Again, first highly deviated well. Um, this is the first time anybody tried to stimulate geothermal wells uh, for, for production and, and flow control, critical. Uh, obviously, we demonstrated new, new PDC bit. 
NOV saw a business opportunity. A and so they put their own money into designing and redesigning these bits. This is a, they were unique. Uh, uh, because we're looking at bigger hole sizes typically than you are, much hotter, hotter temperatures. Um, you know, th there's no inventory, there's no incentive for somebody to be building bigger rotary steerable systems and having an inventory of them. And this is a problem. We can't find plugs. We can't find anything that we need that works. Um, Obviously, you think about it, we're going to do 30 stages or whatever it is. Ultimately, I don't want to have a rig sitting there for, for a couple of weeks while we try to um, uh, deploy bridge plugs and packers. You know, that was a million dollars just to bring them out. And our own company, uh, the company we're going to use, canceled our contract two weeks before we were going to start. You know, it's hard to find crews and rigs, as, as you probably know especially for one-offs, okay? Um, we, we did stimulate 16A. I think it was a very successful uh, stimulation. All of the data that has been collected is publicly available. You can go to this GDR, Geothermal Data Repository, and get it. Everything we have done is publicly available, okay? You want the pacing logs, you go there and get them. It's, it's all there. And I think that's unique because you don't see that in the oil and gas industry. And, and, and so I'm going to harp on it, but I'm going to, you know, John will, I'm sure. This is the only project I'm aware of where everything is public and it's available. And if you can't find it, we'll give it to you. We will find it for you. Um, after, um, uh, the, for the next year or two, um, we plan to drill Two production wells, so one in 2023. As I said, I have an extension out there to 2030. We will drill a third production well. Um, th this was um, non-competitive uh, uh, proposal, okay? We're not competing with anybody. There will be other proposals. You may see them for 84 million. Those are for four demonstration projects. We're not involved in that, okay? Um, we're gonna create and expand the reservoir, uh, long-term flow testing. Uh, will be coming along, and we will be drilling additional wells of opportunity. Some of our wells are now wells of opportunity, which is they are specifically designed for you to put tools into them and, and see if they don't fail, you know, to test these tools. That can be anything from bits to novel stimulation techniques, okay? And, and operationally, we will help you get them in, and we will help you pull them out if we have to. Okay, so I just thank you, and I appreciate your patience. <laughs>